Um, thank you very much for coming to attend our session. And today I'm going to be giving you a little brief overview about the OER initiative that we've launched at the University of Cape Town. And uh, my co-author, Shiam Donnelly, is unable to be here, but um, thanks to her for her contribution. On the 12th of February this year, we launched our open content directory. And I mean directory, it's not a repository. And that's one of the important things that we took a decision upon. We link to this directory materials that are available from any source where uh, lecturers and senior students have actually made their teaching and learning materials available. We were fortunate enough to have funding from a local foundation, the Shuttleworth Foundation, to launch this directory. And just to give you a sense of the scale, um, we launched this entire initiative on the equivalent of $100,000. If you compare it to the, is it about $33 million that you, uh, um, uh, MIT had? We, we don't compare. So in fact, right from the start, we had to think about sustainability, even before we got into the project, because we knew we were not going to have that kind of financial support going forward. And that is what I'm going to be touching on today. Right now, we have 80 resources on our directory. And uh, I say resources, and this is always the vexed issue, what constitutes a resource? Well, in our instance at the moment, a resource can be anything from a single PowerPoint presentation um, to a complete textbook, um, to a complete course with all the details, exercises, formative feedback, etc. So it does range. Um, just to give you an idea, um, in the health sciences, we have textbooks, the sort of concept-based textbooks. We have complete course modules. We have different manuals. And we have sort of practice-based textbooks. Just last week, um, we conducted the survey, as Joseph uh, mentioned. And we asked, um, in addition to the questions um, about OCW in general, we asked questions about our directory. And uh, it was quite interesting that um, although the students are still fairly unfamiliar with the, our own um, open content directory, they said they would use material from open content um, themselves. And then we have a particular interest in how students, we have a big, strong student um, outreach initiative where our, our students go out into the community and teach um, school children on Saturdays and during the week. And we were quite interested to know how they would be using OER materials to support that outreach initiative. So we were quite interested to see that there's a strongly agree, 20%, 29% agree. Um, but very few are disagreeing. So in this instance, um, it's quite, quite positive. Obviously, we only had about a 10% response rate. So this does need to be taken in context. But at least we're getting some feedback. And obviously, we'll run these each year to keep track so that we can do comparative analysis like Joseph did. How did we get to this? Well, in fact, we didn't just start off with the directory. Um, the directory, the establishment of that was actually preceded by a research project. Our funders, the Shuttleworth Foundation, I think had the main insight that you don't just run in and start implementing. You do a little homework first. And that homework involved us looking not only at OER, but looking at how information communication technologies can actually be used to better leverage research, teaching and learning, and outreach at the university. So in fact, the open education resources um, thread, uh, the teaching thread, um, led to additional funds for the establishment of the UCT Open Content Directory. But a lot of the conceptual work about what this could look like and what a possible OER initiative could, like, could look like for a university in Africa came out of the original research. At the same time, um, there was another project um, funded by the Hewlett Foundation, um, which is in combination with our university, University of Cape Town, and the University of the Western Cape, both universities in South Africa, with three universities in Ghana, looking at producing health OER, so OER materials directly related to health. And we did, I think, a very clever thing. Instead of us um, running these projects separately, we actually found ways to integrate our project team meetings 
so that in fact uh, the OER health piggybacked on the initiatives that we were undertaking. So there was uh, kind of inter-project work uh, which actually really leveraged um, the effort that we put in. In preparing for our project, we looked at the time at some of the initial thinking about sustainability, um, both from Downs and from Wiley. I won't go into the details there because of you know it, but just in terms of how we saw our, our way going forward. Initially, we thought that there is a way and perhaps we can belong to a, a member group, maybe the OCW group, um, possibly connections, we weren't quite sure, um, but certainly OCW was on the cards. Um, we felt that uh, we really did have to um, rely at least for, for seed funding on the philanthropic foundations, but we knew that was only for a time. We did also um, look at the whole issue of partnerships, and in that respect we, we've partnered with um, the Health OER initiative, um, which includes the University of Michigan, uh, which I forgot to mention earlier, and in fact have extended that um, partnership to uh, look at sharing of tools as well as processes. Um, they have met with some of our colleagues, we've met with others, we've had visits, we've had a colleague to, uh, go on a sabbatical there, so we've really shared with the University of Michigan. And then finally we looked at how our own institution should be providing some support um, for this initiative. The choices that we made eventually led to um, our key decisions. Number one, it would be resource-based rather than a complete course because we realized if we had to wait until we'd had uh, the, the buy-in from lecturers in a mainly campus-based university that didn't have a strong um, use of, well they did have quite a strong use of digital, te digital technology, but um, most people saw it just as a supplement to the face-to-face. -to -face. So instead of us going for the whole course base, we went to uh, resources which people were prepared to share at the time, which meant we could get things up and running as quickly as possible. We also made choices about it being contributor-led, and perhaps I can talk about that in the pride of authorship at the same time, to make sure that we uh, made it possible for lecturers to be able to contribute directly without going through in a complete um, unit where they would perhaps look at the design of the materials and, and at all the copyright issues so that it was quick and um, obviously cheaper. Um, and then the whole idea of the pride of authorship is that the, the lecturer who's putting up the materials um, really needs to take um, the responsibility for making sure that those are quality materials. I mentioned earlier that we had a directory rather than a repository because we have materials that are housed in various different locations. And rather than focus on an institutional repository, we went, okay, where are these things right now? The most important thing is, let's link them. And uh, the idea is to get them as uh, link them to as close as possible to where the original contributor can adapt them as quickly as possible. Um, instead of going for a um, proprietary kind of um, directory interface, we used Drupal um, as our open source, uh, sort of out the box directory. Uh, we did customize it some, but it's basically um, a fairly easy uh, set of software to reconfigure. We also made sure that we met international standards, the OAR, so that we could have a federated harvesting. At the moment, we um, link directly to OER Commons, and after today's lecture, we will be looking at global, um, as Eric offered. We do have a very small um, copyright moderation process, but it really is not uh, at the same levels, for example, the open education, the um, open university um, in the UK, they have a much more detailed process than we do, um, primarily because we don't have the, the funding to actually staff that. But we do a, we do a copyright uh, clearance and we do check the metadata and sometimes we do help them technically um, uploading images, etc. But it's a really a kind of lightweight moderation process. What we have done um, now, after the, this project is now finished in terms of our funding, we have now institutionalized the management of this process within our existing um, Center for Educational Technology. Um, likewise, the maintenance of the um, directory is now accommodated within the portfolios of the existing group, so we're not reliant on additional funding to actually keep the process going. 
But most importantly, and this is, I think, the message for us today, is that we have realized, uh, primarily from our research project, is that OER is merely one part of how ICTs can support the university's key missions, and that is the one of teaching. But it needs to be linked to research and community engagement, because it's all one thing. So what um, we did as a next step was to say, well, how are other people dealing with um, sustainability? And I, uh, the paper will give you more details, but um, I did a quick survey um, with colleagues around how they're dealing with um, sustainability issues. And quite clearly, the, um, the membership um, model came up as um, important. Um, MIT was quite strong on donations, which we don't have yet in South Africa. Um, strong institutional support was also possible. Um, the government um, involvement became quite clear, um, both from the, both open universities, both in the UK and the Netherlands. All of us were drawing on philanthropic um, foundation funding to start off with at least. And uh, then the, the open university in the Netherlands had some very interesting ideas about um, adding value in terms of new services they were offering. And an additional one which we hadn't thought about, which was how MIT were using affiliate agreements with Amazon, um, where they get uh, approximately about a 10% feed, 10% uh, kickback on if students um, go straight from the MIT site to, to Amazon and order the book. And Steve Carson said to me it's worth about $40,000 a year. So you know, that money would go out and waste it unless it was picked up. So that gave us a few more ideas. And what we did was take our initial decisions, some of the survey results, um, and looked at some of the new um, uh, work that had been done about sustainability and fed that into a sustainability workshop um, earlier on this year and started to extend some of the strategies. And that's what I'm sharing with you today is... Um, one of our insights was that we, we actually can't just operate from an institutional level. We've got to start looking at the range. How do we operate in, in, in an international forum? We have got to be lobbying with other um, universities around the world in terms of how we lobby, lobby donor and research agencies. And in the same way as the, the open access um, initiatives have been lobbied by agencies like the Wellcome Trust that now make it obligatory that you have the, the materials um, made of freely available for which they have paid in their research, we would like to see something along the lines of if you have research work that's made available, how do we translate that into some teaching um, as part of um, a donor fund? Technically, obviously, we want to ensure interoperability and metadata standards, and although those are fairly clear, there's still some tweaks that we can actually help to keep them better. Uh, and also sort of a, a cultural change. We need to conduct OER research, and I mean, Joseph's um, uh, given us an idea about that. Nationally as well, we're going to start lobbying our own government to draw on um, funds. We pay a 1% skills levy back to the government every year, and we need to draw on that money back to the institution. Legally, we will start uh, continue to our work with um, Creative Commons. Um, lecturers are very unsure about... Um, copyright in general, and alternative licensing even less. Uh, provincially, we're actually looking at developing uh, OER projects. And on an institutional basis, we are going to be linking our open content to our admission system, so we can also make those links between where, uh, for a marketing purpose, as we heard from one of the speakers yesterday. We also need to make sure that in our performance appraisal processes that teaching and learning materials are foregrounded. Like other universities mentioned here, the German one, um, the focus in South African universities is on research, research, and more research. Teaching is seen as very much the second cousin. Um, legally, we've got, we provide a range of um, uh, alternative licenses, but we've got to educate our uh, academic colleagues about that. Departmentally, our key ideas are lobbying, um, providing feedback and support, and marketing internally. And on an individual basis, which we see as our key mover and shaker, is to try and encourage our South African colleagues to provide unique content. Because uh, a lot of the problem at the moment is a lot of the materials that are available are ma made available in the north. And people are saying, oh, but we're forced to have all this material. We're saying, absolute nonsense. This is our opportunity to make our perspective from the South available. We can now sit right next to MIT and Harvard in OER Commons. So 
it's our responsibility. Um, and organisationally, we are uh, working uh, very closely with soon-to-be right retirees. So moving forward, three points. It's about embedding processes and transforming practices within the institution. It's a, it's, and it is disruptive, there's no doubt. It's also about changing a worldview on the value of sharing, particularly in this very competitive environment. Um, it, it runs deep. This is a cultural change. And particularly, it's, it's about leveraging, leveraging the synergies between open education resources, research and community engagement. One example, and I end on that. This year, we had an occupational lecturer, oc occupational therapy lecturer, who put together on our open content site a series of lectures on a particular, on a, on a whole range of um, issues, and a set of um, journal editors from a Spanish um, journal um, found her work on the internet and said this would be a wonderful introduction to our special edition on this particular theory and please could we translate your work and include it as a journal article um, in our latest edition. And this has been done, it's now available online in an open access journal as well. So I think the the point is, this was never one of our use cases. <laughs> we never thought about OER into research. We had we had done a use case from research, working back into teaching and learning, but we had never thought about the other way around. So we're learning and finding new ways to actually leverage uh, the synergies. Thank you very much. Thank you.